<clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to spend the day looking at verse 10. Um, in one sense, it's simple. The other, it's just profound. Um, and we'll introduce that as we go. Um, well, let me, let me, everything I want to say is an introduction, so let me read the verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 10 through 12, but I also want to read chapter 3, verse 3 with that. So it says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by, uh, and that ye all, I'll start again. And now, and now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Clo, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. I'm just going to skip the rest. Look over chapter 3, verse 3. It says, are ye, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do pray that as we look at this verse of Scripture, and, and go back to verse 10 and realize there in that verse, uh, what you said is possible, and may we realize that not only is it possible, but the how-to is given to us in these verses of Scripture that we're going to study today. So I pray that it might be clear to each one of us, and, and even in the repetition might be something that actually benefits us. And we pray this in the Savior's name. Amen. Now what we have there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, everything prior to that in our introduction to 1 Corinthians, I told you verses 1 through 9 is the introduction to the book. But you notice in verse 10 it begins with that word, now. So it's like, okay, I've said some things that got us going, and now let's get into the, the reason I'm writing the book. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And I don't know about you, but when I read that verse, the first thought to my, my mind is, that's not possible. <laughs> I know that it's not existing among the Corinthians, but I don't know any church that it does exist among in, in the sense of uh, uh, an external reality. There's always problems within a church. There's always some kind of division. And that verse is not just written there to be like some thought that wouldn't that be wonderful, this could be. Paul's actually going to give in this verse the answer to the Corinthian problem. Uh, it's it's going to be the answer to the whole of every every problem that exists in the book of Corinthians, but especially the problem that exists in the first four chapters of the book. Uh, when what the way I, I looked at this verse, looking at it and preparing for looking at the whole four chapters, that I realized that this is the key to all the solution that, that's at Corinth. Uh, the, all the problems that existed, all the questions, all the confusion, all the cornality that was going on. This verse has the answer. And there's a, sec, a, set, a, a, a section here that Paul especially is applying this to. Now, I think it applies to the whole book, but you need to realize that Paul then in verse 11 starts out with a particular problem. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Clo, that there are contentions among you. And, and I read those other verses so that you'd realize there's divisions among them. And that the answer to the contention and the, and the divisions at Corinth is that they would learn to practice verse 10. So we're going to learn today, we're going to talk about those things that are in verse 10, and we're going to learn how to speak the same thing. We're going to learn how to have no divisions among us. We're going to learn how to be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Uh, we're perfectly joined together, how about that? And then we're going to talk about how to have the same judgment. Uh, and, and Paul just says it there, but the answer is, is, is easily, if you just read those first four chapters, you begin to see how it is that what he said in verse 10, he's teaching them in those first four chapters and really throughout the whole book. But in, when I say in those first four chapters, he deals with verse 11, the first problem that was reported to him. Look over at the end of chapter 4. And rather than read the end of chapter 4 there, look, look at the... 
Well, the last verse in chapter 4 says, uh, what, what will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod or in love and in the spirit of meekness? So he's correcting some things and, and he's giving them a warning. That you get it corrected before I get there and, and everything can be better. But when you get to chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. So now he's going to deal with another problem that's been reported to him that he has to deal with at Corinthians. At the, Cor at the church of Corinth. So uh, I read that to you so you, read, you realize there's a connection that runs from chapter 1 to chapter 4 that Paul deals with a situation, then he's going to deal with the next situation beginning in chapter 5. But all of that, before he even gets into the problem, he gives a solution. And the solution to the whole book, and especially the solution to the first four chapters, is verse 10 uh, of chapter 1. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Well, that'll solve some problems. And that there be no divisions among you. Well, there were divisions among them. But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So he's going to teach them that this is what they need to have in order not to have the problems they have at Corinth. And, and so that where, where verse 10 looks at, could that possibly be possible to have that? Certainly, Paul wouldn't say that if it wasn't possible. And, and so we're going to learn about each one of those and talk about each one of those and understand why it wasn't existing at Corinth and how it could exist at Corinth and certainly how it could exist here at Grace Bible Church. So, how to speak the same thing? Well, verse 12 says an interesting statement. It's not exactly the context, but watch what it says. Verse 12 says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith. So, we're going to talk about how to speak the same thing. And Paul immediately says, Now this I say, and every one of you say. <laughs> every one of you, they're saying all kinds of things. But Paul says something. And if we would learn to, to say what Paul said, it wouldn't be every one of us saying whatever we want to say. Because that's part of the problem. We're not saying the same things because every one of you saith different things. It's interesting in verse 12 there, and I could almost preach next week's message because it's amazing what he says and how that would apply even to modern day. You'll, you'll see it as we get into the verse. But he says, now, now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. And when you learn about who those men are, then you realize what it is that they're divided over, and what they're saying, and how they're identifying with certain men. And, and one of the things, one of the, when Apollos is mentioned in the Bible, hopefully you know something who Paul is, uh, but when Apollos is mentioned in the Bible, he's someone that the Bible talks about his eloquence, in, in his ability to speak. And so naturally, some people would be drawn to him. Of course, there's Peter, who is the head of the twelve apostles. Who wouldn't want to follow Peter? And then there's Paul. He's the only one that came to the Gentiles. So some people say, let's follow him. Then there's, oh, I don't follow anybody. I only follow Christ. The words in red in your Bible, that's the, that's, that's the only ones I follow. And uh, it's amazing how people practice that very thing today. So they're not speaking what Paul says. They're saying all kinds of things, whatever they want to say. And, and the goal is to speak the same thing. And so we need to find out what Paul said, as he is the apostle of the Gentiles, and not what everybody else says. Because what everybody else says is human wisdom. It's, it's what they think. It comes out of their mind. But what Paul said, he's writing by inspiration of God and telling us what God has to say to you and me. So we need to find out what Paul said about different issues and then say what Paul said. And if we all say what Paul said, we'll be all saying the same thing, won't we? So, so let's look at just, just how that's found right here in 1 Corinthians. Look, jump over to chapter 2. It says in verse 1, And I, brethren, I came not to you, uh, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So Paul talks about when he came, how he, he didn't come one way. And then he says in verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. When Paul opened his mouth, that when it, especially when you see, I'll explain some verses later, that demonstration of Spirit of power, when Paul would speak, he's speaking the Word of God. 
We've already talked about that early in Corinth, the Bible's not written yet, so when Paul would speak the Word of God, there were miraculous signs and wonders that would prove what he's speaking is the Word of God. And he's speaking with absolute authority and power. And, and so when he spoke, he's speaking God's Word, and it's backed up with the power of God's Word. Now, God's Word itself is powerful. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We don't need the miraculous signs. But when Paul came, he came and he's speaking by the Spirit of God and demonstrating with some power, some signs and wonders, what he says is God's Word for us Gentiles. So he came not in the human and not even in his own power, but in the demonstration of, of the Spirit and of power of God. So that when you get down to verse 6, it says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. So when we talk about speak like Paul speaks, well, Paul doesn't speak the wisdom of this world. He, he, when he speaks, he says, nor the princes of this world come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So there is some, a special revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul, and when he speaks, he doesn't speak from what man's wisdom, what the prince of this world knew or didn't know in verse 8, but he speaks what God had given to him that wasn't revealed, that's now revealed, and it's God's word for us Gentiles. It says over in verse 13, he says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, so even if, not only does he not teach with man's wisdom and the enticing words of man, but he doesn't use man's words. It says, which things we speak, not in the words of which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. By the way, it just jumped in my mind when I'm reading that. I got a, yesterday, well, Friday's and yesterday's mail, I looked at it this morning, sorted it, and I got a postcard about a new Bible version that's out. <laughs> the last one that came out, that English Standard Version, I haven't hardly seen much about it. I've heard a lot of talk about it. But, but now there's another, the Christian Standard Version or something. I've got to remember what the name of it is. But I've got a postcard. Now this is the newest one out. And I'm thinking about man's, not in words of man's wisdom, but which the Holy Ghost. When Paul spoke, he wasn't just choosing his own words. When you get into these other translations, we were talking about it when we were going through the ark and other things yesterday, is that some of the reason that the other translations read differently, oh yeah, Kevin was reading the, when they're trying to give the gospel, and they're murdering every gospel verse. Uh, and, and, just, and, and when I say murder, just watering it down, not exactly saying it like the King James does. And I explained that they have to do that because they have, they're copyrighted. And they can't just copy the way the King James says it. They have to change it and use man's words to explain it so that they could copyright their book, their Bible, and people who use it will then have to pay them a royalty if, if they charge so or so. But anyhow, in that verse, Paul, the words he's using, he's not reaching his own vocabulary to grab the words that he wants to share. But these are the words that the Holy Ghost has been given him. And, and so he's speaking those words as he speaks. And, and you need to recognize that to, to understand what, uh, what it is, if we're going to speak the same thing, that we've got to recognize the fact that, the Holy, that Paul spoke what the Holy Ghost gave him. We take the King James Bible as being an accurate, reliable translation of the w words that God gave to the Apostle Paul. We don't need to change them to, for, for copyright purposes or anything, and we don't need to water it. Man don't realize he's watering it down, he's just changing it. But every time there's a change, you think about the way the King James said it, and the way this said it, and this will always be degrading. The King James is always uplifting, every time. Anyhow, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So Paul, he spoke to them. He used, he used not human wisdom, but the words that God gave him to speak. And here, when he starts dealing with the, with the Corinthians in their carnality, he couldn't teach them some deeper things. He had to, teach, he had to feed them with milk. I, I, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. They weren't able to understand some of the, the meat of God's Word. So he had to deal with them in the milk of God's Word. But again, that's Paul speaking and dealing with them, and you would learn the milk of God's Word in Corinthians. Come over to chapter 4 and verse 19. He says, but, but, what, but I will come to you shortly, 
if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them that are puffed up, <laughs> but the power. So <laughs> he's coming to them. Verse 20 says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love uh, and in the spirit of meekness? Now it's, he, he's got power behind his words. God is using, he's not just, he's just not just like people say, Paul's the greatest evangelist. No, he's not evangelist, he's an apostle. And these people aren't believing or saying the things that Paul said because Paul's got God's word for us today and people are saying something different and they don't have the power behind their words. He does. And if he's got to stand off against them, they're going to find out what kind of power he has. And, and that will be a demonstration of power in the sense of maybe judgment on those other people. So he's coming to them and they're going to know his speech and the power of his speech. And, uh, and the other people are just speaking words of their own choice. So how can we all speak the same thing? Well, we need to get into Paul's epistles, read what Paul said, and say what Paul said. And when we do, we'll all say the same thing, won't we? Now, by the way, most of what we're going to do now is almost a repeat of that, but all with a little bit different slant each time. Because the other thing it said, it says, and that, you, that there be no divisions among you. So how is it that we, we, would have, we can have no divisions among us? Well, the answer to that is don't follow men based upon his character, his charisma, his eloquence, his influence, his religious author, uh, uh, affinity, uh, uh, affiliations, his intellect, his nobility, his popularity, his esteem among other men. Now, I, I made that list because when you read through the, the Corinthians, you're going to realize there's divisions. When they're saying, I'm of, they're picking men that they like based on maybe character. Like, Paul, he might be real tough, so the guys who are tough, oh, I like him. But someone says, well, I like someone mild, like like Apollos, he speaks so soft and kind. Well, it's not how he speaks, it's, it's what he's speaking and what power is behind his speaking. What words is he using? Is it the word of God? That, that's what's important. But it is, it's a hard thing to overcome because when people go and they hear speakers, especially go check out churches. Uh, I write letters to people who... who write Grace Bible Church, and they say, well, I'm thinking of visiting the church, and uh, could you send us some information about your church? When we send them some information, I send them a letter, and it says, if I was looking for a church, I'd be looking for a church that teaches the truth. Because that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for a church maybe with a big youth group, or a big choir, or you know, a nice sound system, or a, a, a man who has a doctorate's degree that can dazzle them with his brilliance. They're not going to get that here. <laughs> But they are looking for those things. And that, that's really just human nature. And, and that, all those things cause divisions among them. So in that list, the, it, they, they follow men based on character. Well, that's going to cause division. Charisma, you know, how, how charismatic the man is. Uh, how eloquent, and, that, and that's why I say Apollos, that's what known, he's known for. Uh, how, it, how much influence he has, maybe over people. I'm always amazed how some pastors can just demand people do something and they just jump and do it. And, uh, but some people have that kind of influence. Certainly religious affiliation, that's what most people, they go to a church because my grandma was such and such an affiliation, so I go to that kind of church. They just go because tradition has led them that way. Or uh, based on intellect or nobility, there you know, could be something, someone who's very popular or is esteemed among men, doctor so-and-so. Oh, that man has a doctorate's degree, therefore I'm going to go there. So people go for all those reasons. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, again in verse 12. You got that statement. Now I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. So they're saying that because they're following men. They're, 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 there's something about men that they're being drawn to men based on the character and how they like those men. Look over in verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Now that's interesting. First of all, where is the wise? Some people just follow men that have philosophical wisdom. Where is the scribe? Oh, I like the religious man. You know, like, like where is the scribe? You, you think about that place in uh, Matthew 17. The Lord goes on the Mount of Transfiguration. He comes down, 
And, and immediately the apostles begin to think about, they saw Moses and Elijah there. And so they asked the Lord, why do the scribes say that Elijah must first come before Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom? And he says, Elijah shall first come. And then he talks about how John the Baptist could have been that, but it will be Elijah before he comes the second time. And, and, so the, the scribes knew something. I say that to you because some people are going to say, where's the, where's the wise, where is the scribe? That is, where, where's the wise man that has all the answers in this world? Where is the scribe, the religious man who thinks he's got all the answers? Because, isn't it interesting, the scribes who knew some things about Scripture and the Lord says they were right are the same ones who rejected him? Isn't that amazing? But they did. And then, where's the disputer of this world? There's those guys that are so good at public speaking and debate that even if they're wrong, they can make the person speaking the truth look foolish and then look right. And, and, and you know, some people just follow, oh, he won that debate. Well, it don't matter if he won the debate. Is it right or is it wrong? But, so the, the verse, where is the, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now we'll talk about that. That's a question. I read that and I think, I know an answer to that, but is that obvious to everybody? <laughs> and, and sometimes when I say obvious to me, I know what it's a re reference to, but you have to think it through because the, que the statement is, yeah, God has already done this. Not that he's going to do it at the second coming of Christ, show that the world wisdom is vain. It's ar he's already accomplished it. We'll talk about that in a moment. But anyhow, you, you see how they're looking at men and esteeming men. Verse 29 of chapter 1 there. It says, That no flesh should glory in his presence. So God uses foolish things, and he gets to that point that no flesh should glory in his presence. The Corinthians were glorying in men. You see this over and over again. Chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So the Corinthians, they were divided because of how they respected man, what they thought about man, how they elevated man, how they glorified man, and the wisdom of man. And, and they put their faith in, the, in that wisdom. Verse 14 says, uh, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. <laughs> A man who's saved, no matter how smart, how wise, how intellectual, what a debater he might be, if he's lost, he, do, he can't know the things of God. He just, he's left only to himself, and you would take and listen to a man and, and glory, glory in his wisdom and his speaking ability when he's not even saved, can't even give you the gospel. But see, the Corinthians were glorying in men, and Paul putting man in his proper place. Chapter 3 and verse 7 says... So then, neither he that planteth is anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now there, he's talking about him and Apollos. But as far as men, they're nothing. Everything centers in God. So that when you get over to chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transfigured, uh, transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that, uh, that no one of you be puffed up one against another. So you see what it is that's causing divisions among them. What they think of the character and all the other influences that man has over them, they're caught up in man. And Paul is straightening that, that, these four chapters. He's he taken that away from them. And he even used himself so that they would learn in him and Apollos not to think about men above that which is written. But that no, flesh be, uh, that no one be puffed up one against another. And so there was divisions based on how they were thinking of men. But how does the Bible tell us to think of man? Well, one of the verses that you learn real young, if you come to Sunday school, is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. One of my favorite verses is when people start thinking that God is done with Israel, he's not going to fulfill his promises, Paul says, God forbid that, that God will fulfill his promises. He said, let God be true and every man a liar. That's what's written about men. God is true, every man is a liar. 
So if you're going to follow men and what men say, you're not to think about a man above what the Bible says. He'll lie to you. I'll lie to you. I'm not above any of that. Now, I don't try to do that. You watch and check me, make sure I don't. But don't ever elevate a man. Believe what God said. And, and think about man as the Bible speaks about man. In fact, come back to Romans 3. That was Paul's first <laughs> in giving the gospel, realizing how you got to trust what Jesus Christ did. Not only did, did he get to verse 23 and said, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he says in verse 10, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together, mankind, Jew and Gentile, become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You, you think, that, oh, that's a good man. Well, no. Verse, now watch these verses. Verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. <laughs> the, 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 with their tongue they have used deceit. The poison of an asp, of asp is, is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Then it moves on to the feet. All of that is just what's going to come out of their mouth. So Paul, he's writing, speaking, using words that the Holy Ghost gives, God's word to us, and he says that there be no divisions among you, and the way to have no divisions among you, don't elevate man, don't glory in man. Don't think about man above what the Bible said. Here's what the Bible said. Don't think of man above. He, any man's capable of doing that to you. So know what God said to you and don't follow man, especially all the ways that man can influence you. And people do. I mean, uh, you, you can't help but, but uh, uh, respect like someone who teaches you. One of my early experiences in coming into right division was that I was down in Bible college. And I had Dr. Seymour, and I had Dr. Cameron, and I had Dr. Stanford as my professors. And they were teaching me things that my dad said was not true. And he sent me books from Stam. Stam wasn't a doctor. In fact, you can't buy the book, The Controversy. But when Stam started writing about right division, the people who had doctorate's degree are writing him letters. And they're saying, what are your credentials? Who are you to say these things? And, and he says, he, he'd write about doctrine, and they write back to him, who are you, where'd you go to school? So when he got, you know, when you come into grace, you, you wonder, why doesn't someone else teach this? Well, back in his day, he, he wrote to all those men. And when they wrote back to him, he put their letters in a book, he called it the controversy. So that when people say, why doesn't Dr. De, De Han believe these things? You can look it up and read what Dr. Hahn thought about Pastor Stam and whether he's dealing with the doctrine or whether he's attacking the man. My, I don't know why I said all that except to say that as I was trying to figure out right division, is Paul the apostle? Did the age of grace begin with Paul or did it begin at the day of Pentecost like my doctor, my professors with doctorate's degree was teaching me? That eventually I had to give up believing what Dr. So-and-so said and go back and I said, you know, Paul's not one of the twelve. He made it real clear he's not. And that God called him for a particular reason and gave him the dispensation of the grace of God. And it's in his writing that I find those truths. And the next thing you know, I become a grace believer. But I had to give up the prestige of men. So anyhow, in order to, have to speak the same thing, we've got to find out what God said through Paul and use his words. To have no divisions among us is don't put man anywhere above God's word. You let God's word be the answer to everything. And if everybody would just say what God said and believe what God said through Paul to us, there'd be no divisions among us. Now that other one. How in the world can we be perfectly joined together in the same mind? <laughs> I mean, if you just left the word perfect out, I'd say, well, we can be joined together in the same mind perfectly joined together. God didn't leave us where we can almost come together with the right thinking, that we can be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Well, let's first look at what the wrong mind is. And again, this is a little bit of a repeat. In chapter 3 and verse 21, it says that there be no, that let, therefore let no man glory in man, for all things are yours. So first, first is, don't glory in men. We've learned that already because that causes division. Put your faith, uh, uh, they were putting their faith in the wisdom of men. We've already looked at that. 
and, and not according to what was written, as Paul would say. For instance, uh, chapter 4 and verse 6, And these things, brethren, uh, I, have I, I have in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, uh, that no one be puffed up one against another. So Paul's writing, and they're, they're following other writings, and as a result, they were carnal. Look at back at chapter 3, when he said that they were like children, watch why they're children. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Even as a babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So, they weren't taking in God's word and growing, and as a result, they were taking in man's word, and they weren't perfectly joined together in the same mind. The solution, now there's no doubt when you think about the solution here, is the book of Philippians, we're going to go there in a second, but it talks about, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. You'll see that in Philippians is the answer to the problem at Corinth, but the problem at Corinth, you know, when you read this, 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 this section here, he uses the word wise and wisdom, he uses the word wise ten times, the word wisdom seventeen times. There's a battle going on here in the mind of the Corinthians between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. Look, look back at chapter 1, look at verse 18. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now when I asked you a moment ago, I says, where, wh when was it that God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Because the world still thinks they're smarter than God. But verse 18 was the answer to that. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us which are saved, it is the power of God. What, was, what God has accomplished in the cross, and when you learn about the preaching of the cross, and what was accomplished in the cross, and how that's an answer, a perfect answer, to sinful men being right with God and having eternal life. What, what wisdom God demonstrated in that cross that the world looks at, and your Savior died, they don't understand anything. But that's where God destroyed the wisdom of this world. He did it in this way. Come, come with me to Philippians chapter 2. Now I'm going to start in verse 2 of chapter 2, so that you, you can see that it's got the same context of 1 Corinthians 1 that we're studying. It says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, uh, uh, being of one accord, of one mind. Okay, he's, got, he, he's going to deal with the same issue, and he's got the same solution in both places. He said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, said, glory in men, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So, to have the, the same... Uh, be perfectly joined together with the same mind is not what you think about something, I think about something. It's how to have the mind of Christ about all things. And the mind of Christ is first talked about here, who, to have his mind, verse 6 says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, he wasn't after man's approval, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. So God not only raised him from the dead, but highly exalted him far above all heavens, the Bible says. But that mind of Christ, there's several things you could look at, I just want you to get this here, is that Christ had first a mind of humility. 
He was in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and he becomes a man. But in his humanity, there's perfect obedience to the will of God and not his own will. That he, he came in obedience to do the will of the Father, which led to even the death of the cross. To have the mind of Christ is, first of all, to have a mind of humility. You're not better than someone else. But then, and then to even become a servant to all men. But to be obedient to God the Father. Take God's word in every situation. Apply what God said to the situation. That'd be of the same mind. And then you could be perfectly joined together in the same uh, mind and judgment. So you have this, this, this mind of Christ. You're not exalting yourself. You're doing the God's will in every situation, even the death of the cross, no matter what it cost. See, there's a certain point that each one of us stops and says, Oh, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to suffer. I don't want to die. I don't want to go through this. But the Lord Jesus Christ did. And he did all that in perfect obedience to God the Father. And in doing that, he destroyed the wisdom of this world. Because, as we'll learn as we study 1 Corinthians chapter 2, is that what Jesus Christ did in perfect humility and obedience to the Father, and going to the point of death, that Jesus Christ conquered Satan, who, when you read the book, uh, when you read uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, the brag that Satan had, he says that he's wiser than Daniel, no secret could be hid from him. Satan had no idea what Jesus Christ was doing when he went to that cross. Man certainly had no idea what Jesus Christ was doing. Jesus Christ, in all that being being taken advantage of men, betrayed by his own, led to death and everybody runs away from him. The Romans crucify him. It looks like total defeat. And he kept doing that because I'm doing not my will, but thy will be done. Nowhere in that would you see the power of God. But it's after he rose from the dead and revealed to the Apostle Paul what he accomplished in that death, burial, and resurrection. That became the wisdom of God and the power of God. It's the power of God to save everyone that believes because Christ died for all of our sins. Salvation's a free gift. And the most surprised person in the universe of what was accomplished in the cross was Satan, who bragged about how wise he was. Just thought he ought to be, he ought to be God because he thought he's wiser than God. Not more powerful, but wiser than God. And Satan had no idea that when he was having the nation of Israel crucify Christ, it was his own downfall. And so in the revelation of what the cross of Christ means and what it accomplished, God destroyed the wisdom of this world. The cross is the answer. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes us. And, and we're to have the mind of Christ in the sense that, that we're to recognize that the cross is the answer. Don't get far from the cross. Stay humble. Be obedient to God's word. Exalt the cross of Christ in everything that you do. And when you do, you'll be perfectly joined together in the same mind. The cross is everything. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. After it told us in verse 29, not to glory in, 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 man's, in, in men, in flesh, verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 1 says, But of him are ye, that is, of God are ye in Christ, who of God is made unto us wisdom, we understand that wisdom of God now. And righteousness and sanctification set apart as holy for, God, for God's eternal purpose. And redemption. All goes right back to the cross. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now that, that's how you would be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Make that cross the center of everything and realize it's of God and it's through Christ that, and the cross of Christ that you have everything. And that'll, that'll keep you in your right place. The last thing it says, and that is to have the same judgment. How can we have the same judgment? Well, watch these verses. Five times, we've been reading them already. I just want to make, point them out again. Chapter 1, in verse 19, Paul says, For it is written, it's good enough right there, go to verse 31, that according as it is written, go over to chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, but as it is written, you go over to chapter uh, 3 and verse 19. 
For the wisdom of this world is foolishness unto God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in his own craftiness. That's what I just described to you, that Satan had no idea that God was defeating him, using him to bring salvation to all of mankind. And then chapter 4 and verse 6, there that we've read it a couple times, and these things, I, as a figure transferred to myself and Apollos, for your sake, uh, that you might learn in us, to, not to think of men, above that which is written. So you think according to what is written. And then, then he wrote the things that God would have us to know and believe. Now we're going to study that as we go through. But I want you to see, when he does that, come over to chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What you're going to see, I'm skipping verses because I just want to end with this. But I, what Paul has done, he's been talking about the wisdom of the world, but the words that God has given to him that he's written down, we've already talked about the words of Christ, uh, that Paul has given to, God has given to Paul for us. So we got God's word to us, and Paul's been writing it down. Now he says, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. That that you, when you think of Paul, you've got to think about, okay, he's the one that's got what God's accomplishing this, in this age of grace that wasn't known. He's a steward of that information. Then in chapter uh, 4 and verse 3, it says, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. We're to have the same judgment, and he's teaching them that the judgment is based on the mind of God, Christ. Look back at chapter 2 and verse 15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath instructed him? But we have the mind of Christ. There's the same mind and the same judgment. And, and that same judgment is coming to us through the Apostle Paul, and Paul just scoffs and laughs at the fact that you were going, the Corinthians are going to judge him. No, they need to have the same judgment, that he has the mind of Christ, and in his writings we have the truth that God has for us. So, verse 14 of chapter 4. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons I warn you. For though you have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of me. Isn't that amazing? You start out, hey, you got, you're just following all kinds of people, and then he ends up and say, be followers of me. Why? Because you've learned what Paul is saying is coming from God. It's God's word to us. He's a steward of the mysteries of God. And no one else went to the Gentiles with the gospel, but Paul did. And so he said, now be followers of me. For this cause I have sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I taught in every church. So, so Paul, not only is he telling them he is the one who's got their instructions for today, he sends Timothy to go back up, and, and Timothy's been instructed in all of Paul's ways in Christ. So to have the same mind and the same judgment, is we are to know God's Word, and who the Apostle Paul is, what he writes, and to who he writes to, and with what authority he writes. And by that, verse chapter, 10, chapter 1, verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, what Paul says, and that ye be, there be no divisions among you. You're not going to glory in man, you're going to glory in the thing God, God has said, you're going to glory in the cross. And that there be no, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. You're going to have the mind of Christ, think like Christ, and speak like Christ, as revealed to us through the Apostle Paul, and that you have the same judgment. Whatever affairs, whatever comes up, you'll be able to think it through based on the Word of God to us, as he, we find in Paul's writings. So verse 10 is possible. We just got to get man out of the way, and we got to get God's Word in us, particularly Paul, the revelation given to the Apostle Paul to us. So, uh, anyhow, when I was reading through those first four chapters, I kept seeing, oh, I say, I say, they say, and realized that it's, all, it's all right there, so that verse 10 is a reality. We just got to make it practical in our life, and each one of us make verse 10 a reality by studying God's Word and believing God's Word and using the words of God and putting that in our mind and living that out. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, 
a little bit of repetition in everything that we just said there, but it just keeps pointing back how important it is to know where we get our doctrine from. Who Paul is and when he writes, it's not his words, it's not man's wisdom, it's what your Holy Ghost has given. And they're the words for us today that center everything to be gloried in your Son and the wisdom of the cross work that has been accomplished already, which has destroyed the wisdom of this world, even the wisdom of Satan. And, and has brought life and light and immortality to light through the gospel. Father, I pray that each one of us would learn to have that mind of Christ and to have the same judgments that, that you have in your word so that we can get along the way that you would have us as a members of body of Christ and as a local church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Another wonderful message from the wonderful Word of God. Let's stand and sing our chorus, Jesus Paid It All. Jesus Paid It All, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, and you are dismissed.